Welcome into the channel, folks. The new inflation data is out. We're going to take a peek at that, see what is going very well in terms of inflation, what's going wrong, what the Fed's likely to do based upon these inflation numbers. We're also going to speak about PayPal, NVIDIA, Palantir, Shopify, Fubo, and the planet in this video as well. But here at the top, we've got to talk about the news that came out two hours ago. World Health Organization declares MPOX outbreaks in Africa, a global health emergency, a new form of the virus spread. Oh, what the heck's going on here? The World Health Organization declared the MPOX outbreaks in Congo and elsewhere in Africa a global emergency on Wednesday, with cases confirmed among children and adults in more than a dozen countries and a new form of the virus spreading. Few vaccine doses are available on the continent. Earlier this week, the African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention announced the MPOX outbreaks were a public health emergency with more than 500 deaths and called for international help to stop the virus spread. This is something that should concern us all. The potential for further spread within Africa and beyond is very worrying, said the World Health Organization director. The Africa CDC previously said MPOX, also known as monkeypox, has been detected in 13 countries this year, and more than 96% of all cases and deaths are in the Congo. Cases are up 160%, and deaths are up 19% compared with the same period last year. So far, there have been more than 14,000 cases, and 524 people have died. For reference, in the United States of America each year, uh, they say around 50,000 people roughly die from influenza and pneumonia-related deaths. The numbers, I've seen projections that the flu kills, I've seen projections anywhere between 100,000 and 700,000 people worldwide on a year, just to kind of give you, uh, you know, kind of some reference in regards to this, right? So I made a joke earlier today. I said, uh, you know, if they, if they need a reason to send stimulus checks, like just, just tell us you want to send us some stimulus checks, okay? You don't need to go through the whole, the whole health thing again. We already went through that in 2020 with the Rona, right? Like, come on, man. If you want to send the stimmy checks, just send them, okay? You don't need to keep covering, but we'll see in, in regards to what happens in the situation. Just goes to show you in the stock market, you always have to be ready for whatever they're going to throw at you, right? And, uh, you know, Rona, I never really took that serious at first when I first heard about that in around January 2020, right? And... No one really did, just to be quite frank with you. And then I think I actually heard about it technically December of 2019. But I remember hearing about it for sure in January 2020, right? And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, we were shutting down the worldwide economy. So you never know what could happen out of nowhere. Always be prepared, folks. Black Swan events can come from anywhere. Hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Appreciate you all joining me. All I need from you guys, smash a like on this video. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel if you're not already. And then pin comment down there today if you're looking to join a private group, my private wealth group, get access to 1000X. I'll put that as a pin comment. You can click on that, fill out your application, and join us in there. Alrighty, so let's get started with inflation. We'll talk about what the Fed's likely to do from here now at this point in time. And then we're going to speak about those stocks, which we have a lot of stocks to speak about and kind of where those stocks are heading from here in this video. Okay. So in terms of inflation, I just kind of wanted to highlight the problem issue areas. There still is inflation because there are still a few problems in regards to inflation. If we look here, fro frozen non-carbonated juice and drinks, 19% up year over year. Eggs is still an issue, 19% up year over year. Frankfurters, can't eat your Frankfurters. That's up almost 10% year over year. This is evil, straight evil. Oh my gosh. How are you going to have bacon up 8.5% year over year? Like, come on, man. And they wonder why everybody's so cranky all the time. Like, you, you, you know, give people the bacon. Let them be happy. Come on, man. 8.5% up year over year. Beef roast up 7.5%. Pork chops up 7.3%. No one likes pork chops anyway, so we don't care about that. Butter up 6.1%. Come on, man. What do they think we like in America? It's bacon and butter, baby. Dried beans, peas, and lentils up 6%. Baby food and formula up 4.6%. Electricity up 4.9%, right? And I kind of look at 4% as kind of the magic number because a lot of people get 3 4% type raises from their jobs on a yearly basis. So anything above 4% is usually what I kind of like highlight as problems. Motor vehicle insurance still a huge issue. That will remain a huge issue until about mid next year. And around mid next year, that's going to drop off. It's not going to be a big issue anymore. But motor vehicle insurance, a huge issue this year. 18.6% up. Ugh, awful. Indoor plants and flowers up over 10% versus last year. That's another evil thing. 
They wonder why people are so dang cranky all the time and have nothing but to do but complain. I mean, if bacon, you can't afford bacon, you can't afford some nice little plants and flowers for your house. Come on, man, that's just evil. Care of invalids, that's always a weird way of putting it. And elderly at home, that's up about 10%. That's a huge number for this next I would say a couple decades here. And the reason being is obviously the baby boomer generation aging. And so I think this is a very important metric to keep an eye on for the next 20 years. Admission to sporting events is ridiculous, up 8.8%. I mean, if it wasn't expensive enough to go to a dang football game, now it's just even more expensive. SIGs, I mean, SIGs have always been insanely expensive. Those are up 8.5%. I hope none of y'all smoke out there because whew, delivery services up 7.8%. We've seen this recently in like uh, UPS numbers and I believe even FedEx numbers where their package volumes aren't that strong, but they're being able to charge more for delivering those packages. Pet services, 6.6% up year over year. This is why people can't afford to have pets, man. Can't afford your flowers. You can't afford your pets. You can't afford your dang bacon. Come on, man. That's just a sad world. Hospital and related services up 6.2%. Don't go to the hospital. Oh, boy. Motor vehicle maintenance and servicing up 6.2%. A lot of people, they choose not to buy EVs. A lot of people choose not to buy EVs, and they go with these internal combustion engines, and then all of a sudden they get hit with those gas prices. They get hit with all those service fees, all that maintenance, and all of a sudden they start thinking, man, maybe I should have bought an EV after all. Laundry, dry services up 5.7%. Rent, this is a very important one. Rent is still an issue, folks. Rent of primary residence of 5.1% year over year. You know, that should not be an issue at all, just to be quite frank with you guys, in 2025 and 2026, but it is still an issue in 2024, and it's not as big of an issue as it was. Daycare and preschool, 5% plus up there. Dental services, don't go to the dentist, or man, it's going to be trouble, 5% up there, okay? Now, my opinion is, we are ready. We are 100% ready for the rate cut cycle now at this point in time. There's no doubt. Now, I told you guys for last, what did I tell you, for the last two years, that when the Fed gets two months of CPI under 3%, something in the twos, they'll start cutting rates. So, we got one. Whoa, look at the balloons. Hold oh, my AI. That's pretty cool. I don't know what I did there, but balloons popped out. So, here we are. We got a 2.9 here. We're likely going to get something in the twos again next month. And guess what? They're going to likely start cutting next month. So just as I thought would happen is exactly what's likely to happen in the situation here now at this point in time. So I would say overall inflation is dead and it's going to remain dead for the next couple of years. And here's why. Okay. If you look at GSG, this is a commodity index. It's down 1.2% over the past year. That puts us in a very good position because keep in mind everything... Basically, that's a physical good in the world. It always comes back to commodities. Now, inflation will remain dead for the next one to two years because inf commodities have been not doing anything for over a year now at this point in time, over a year. And so that's going to help because you got to rem remember what happened in the massive spike in inflation. Was stimulus part of it? Absolutely. Were the shutdowns part of it because it messed up supply chains? Absolutely. But another huge reason that not enough people talk about is the commodity super cycle that happened from basically the Rona lows of around April 2020, right, all the way through into the first half of 2022. It was the most insane commodity cycle we've seen in decades in the United States of America. You could look back at this, right? It's incredible, that move. And so that's why we had such insane inflation in 2022 and 2023 was really that commodity super cycle we had where the GSG went from like eight bucks all the way to like 25 plus dollars in a matter of two years. It wasn't like it took a long, long time to do that. It was a two year span. The commodities went insane. And so that's why even a lot of people, a lot of small businesses were already feeling inflation in 2021 before the Fed was talking about it, before a lot of individuals were talking about it, right? Incredible. So now that commodities have been in this flattish area for quite a while, we're looking good in regards to inflation for at least the next one to two years. And also, if we look, think about rent, which is a huge component of CPI, that's going to be looking very, very good for the next one to two years as well. Now, when it comes to the put-to-call ratio, when it comes to VIX, these babies are dying again at this point in time, which, you know, we go back a week ago, a little over a week ago, 
people were loading the boat on put options left and right. They were caught very off guard. Now all of a sudden people don't want put options. Now all of a sudden they want call options, which shows you how fast the market can swing, right? One minute they're loading puts, next minute they're like, screw put options, we don't need that. Now it's call options, right? It's incredible. The VIX is dying, the VIX is back down to 16, which is a pretty low range for the, the VIX. So VIX is dying, I mean, it's incredible, right? It shows you how quickly things can really turn in the market from you know, good to bad, bad to good, all those sorts of things. Now, in regards to these stocks, I wanna talk about these six stocks specific in this video, where these stocks are headed now, what's going on with them, PayPal, NVIDIA, Palantir, Fubo, Shopify, and the plant, okay? Let's talk PayPal first and foremost. There's huge things going on with PayPal right now, okay? So, in regards to PayPal, it's starting to work out for us a little bit here. It's still a huge lagger for me overall. I mean. If it's less than a 6% gain, but we're up $11,000, so we're moving in the right direction. Stock closed today, $66 plus. But this chart is everything. Look at this. This is a one-month chart, and we have insanely bullish activity going on for PayPal. Okay, insanely bullish. So in the past month, PayPal stock is up 10%, while the Russell 2000 is down 4%, and the NASDAQ is down 7%. This is incredibly bullish. I mean, incredibly bullish for PayPal. Because what we're looking at now in this situation is a situation where essentially the market's even going down. And even though the market's going down, PayPal's still going up. Now imagine if the NASDAQ comes back, the Russell comes back over this next few weeks or whatever, right? Which keep in mind, we're in August right now. And then we're going to go into September. August, September are bad months for the market. So we could easily lose gains and go back down in regards to the indexes. But let's imagine a situation where over the next few weeks, NASDAQ comes rolling back, right? NVIDIA's earnings are great. Oh, the, de the demise of NVIDIA was overblown. Okay, next thing you know, NASDAQ's rolling. We get that 7% up. Do you know how much PayPal's going to be up in that situation? You'll see PayPal go to the 70s or 80s quickly in that sort of situation, like quickly, quickly. And keep in mind, the more momentum that comes into PayPal, the more it attracts more momentum traders, more swing investors, those sorts of folks as well. So it's kind of, you know, the rich getting richer situation. So what we're seeing play out in PayPal is, I think, kind of like best case scenario in regards to stock price, right? And now that we have the fundamentals all going in a great direction, again, it just kind of puts a, a cherry on top in regards to the situation. So basically, PayPal's emerging as kind of like an overweight stock. So you kind of, it's going to do much better than whatever the market does. And so if the, if the NASDAQ goes up 7% over the next few weeks, don't be surprised if PayPal's up you know, 15, 20, 25% over that span. So this is really, really bullish for PayPal. I'm, I'm very happy to see things starting to trend in the right direction, not just in regards to the fundamentals, but the stock price, because I have my position built in PayPal. I'm ready to roll, baby. Like PayPal, you have my full permission to go to 70s, 80s, get back to 100, go to 120. Over this next year, you have my full permission. Now at this point in time, that leads us to Palantir. My gosh, Palantir, what an animal. Look at this. The stock closed here today, $31. We're now up 250% on this position. It's starting to become one of our best stocks in the public account. It is tremendous, right? Now, the thing you gotta understand about Palantir is this stock is, it doesn't care about short-term valuation metrics anymore. It's thrown that out the window. Forward PEs, two year out forward PEs, trailing 12 month PEs, it all doesn't matter anymore for the short term. And the reason being is what's going on with the revenue. The company keeps coming in and beating revenue estimates by considerable margins. And so, you know, we look at like thousandxstocks.com here. We take obviously what analysts are kind of thinking consensus. But here's the thing analysts have been wrong and wrong and wrong on this stock, right? And so who's going to say they're going to all of a sudden be right is a decent probability these numbers are far too low that analysts have here, right? Which means there's much more upside and the game of Wall Street gets a lot more fun in regards to Palantir. I ran some projections here on 1000X with our new fancy tool with the valuation metrics where you can choose P ratios to have the stock at, right? Different growth rates and things like that, right? You know, if you have Palantir doing around $9 billion of revenue in 2028, right? Which... I mean, with how much they're starting to beat these revenue estimates and the fact that they have all this AIP growth and things are just getting more and more exciting, it's looking more and more probable, by the way. I apologize if everybody thinks their ring, uh, their ring ding's going off, okay? Uh, but with everything that's going on with Palantir's business model, now they get the partnership with Microsoft, 
I mean, who knows where this revenue is going now at this point in time, right? Then income should go up at a much faster clip than revenue. So if revenue is up, let's say it goes up 30% on average over the next few years, like net income should blow that number out of the water because this company just flipped a profitability here recently. So I kind of ran them at like a $9 billion run rate for revenue in 2028 with about $2.9 billion of net income, which will put the net income margins at about 32%, which is not a crazy number for a stock with this sort of business model that's kind of like more SaaS related, right? And if the company's growing at these sorts of growth rates, you're going to command a still an insanely high P ratio. You're not going to command a 15, 20, 25 P ratio on a stock like this. It has this sort of growth that has this sort of sticky of a business model. This is like creme de la creme. So you're going to command probably a 50 to 90, right? Which puts the stock between like a 67 and $120 price. That's the thing with Palantir right now is Where's the growth? Like, like it's so much growth and numbers are coming in so strong. It's become imagination stock now. And this might have like a negative kind of sentiment around it, like an imagination stock. But the reason it has imagination stock is because of this, what I'm showing you right here. Look at this. So if we go back four quarters ago, they beat by $2 million. Then they beat by $5 million. Then they beat by $16 million. And then this latest quarter, they beat by $25 million. So... What's next quarter? Are they going to beat by $30 million? Are they going to beat by $40 million? Are they going to beat by $50 million where the analysts are expected? We don't know, right? But the trend is so much in your friend in the situation that we have a situation where it's just your imagination can run with it at this point in time. And that's where Palantir is at. So to try to put a top on where the stock price is going to go in, in the short term, short term meaning the next year, is impossible. It's absolutely impossible because we don't know where revenue growth rates are going to top at. We don't know if we're going back to 30%. Remember, revenue growth this last quarter was 27%. What if we go back to 30%? What if we go to 35%? What if we go to 40%? We don't know, right? And keep in mind, this isn't even like an insanely strong time from a business sentiment standpoint. And Palantir is putting up these sorts of numbers. What happens if, dare I say, right? Everybody's kind of banking on recession over the next couple of years. What happens if the business environment actually gets better over the next few years? Ooh, what happens in that situation? Does Palantir go to a 40% growth rate on the top line? Do they go to a 50%? We don't know. I mean, with Palantir putting up this strong in numbers in this bad of an environment, that's pretty darn incredible. Look at a lot of the SaaS related companies. Look at how bad their numbers have been for the last couple of years. And then you got Palantir growing revenues last quarter, 27%. It's an imagination stock now at this point in time. NVIDIA. So, as I tell you guys with NVIDIA, they still want it bad. Now, who's they? They is Wall Street. And I tell you guys, they want their stock bad still. They act like they don't want it, right? They act like this excuse, that excuse, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, they all want to be in this stock. And it, you look at the five-day chart on the stock, right? 16% of the stock has gone up just in the past five days again. They buy it up every time. Every time you see NVIDIA stock dip, really for almost two years now, there's Wall Street to buy it up and buy it up, buy it up for almost two years straight now, right? They have to own this stock. They want to own this stock. And the reason being, to stick up for they for a moment, the Wall Streeters, is where, remember, Wall Streeters, they like to play a lot of large cap stocks, the mega cap stocks, because they see those as not as risky as playing like small caps or something like that, right? But so in mega cap, where are you going to get these growth rates? Where are you going to get trailing 12-month EPS growth of 700%? And current year expected earnings per share growth of 222%. And next year earnings per share growth of 38%. And where are you getting revenue growth of 100 plus percent in mega cap? And where are you getting gross margins of 78% and net margins of 50 plus percent? Remember, Wall Street cares the most about two things, revenue growth and margin growth, right? Wall Street loves companies that have incredible margins and they love companies that have incredible growth. And so where else are you getting this? This is why these Wall Streeters buy up every dip in the stock. And until you get this company's margins to break, or until you get this company's revenue growth story to break, they will buy every last dip in the stock until that break happens in the business model. When does that happen? I don't know. 
probably not this year, maybe next year, maybe 2026, something like that, right? So if we compare them versus Apple, compare them against Microsoft, right? I mean, it's a night and day difference. Look at NVIDIA's growth rates and expected growth rates versus Microsoft, versus Apple. Look at the revenue growth rates of Microsoft and Apple expected versus NVIDIA. Look at Microsoft's gross margins and net margins. Look at Apple's gross margins and net margins versus NVIDIA. And so if you wonder, why are these Wall Streeters willing to buy every single dip in sight? It's because of that. It's because of that. It's not just, oh, it's hype. It's not just like, oh, it's the exciting stock to be in at the moment. It's because the growth rates. It's because the margins. It's because at the end of the day, you can't find that anywhere else in mega cap tech. Anywhere else. I could compare them with Tesla. I could compare them with my lovely Amazon, right? Those are two stocks I own. They're on a whole different stratosphere. NVIDIA is versus Tesla versus Amazon. I have to admit it, right? And I own NVIDIA stock as well, but it's not as big of a position for me as Tesla and, and Amazon, right? Compare them against my lovely meta, my biggest position in the public account. NVIDIA smashes them. They smash them, right? Compare them versus Google. They smash Google McDougal. Look at the margins, right? Look at the net margins of NVIDIA versus the other companies. This, folks, is why these Wall Streeters will continue to buy this one until the growth story breaks. So, for now, it's up, up, and away for NVIDIA. And as I said, don't be surprised if you see the stock with a 150 in front of it. Don't be surprised if you see it with a 200 in front of it. The, the sentiment on this baby changes quick. All of a sudden, everybody gets scared, worried, 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 right? And then all of a sudden, you get closer to earnings. Everybody starts getting a little more excited about, oh, maybe, maybe there's something here with NVIDIA, right? Then NVIDIA comes out. They smash it. Great conference call. Pew! Rocket ship ride up again, right? Then a little after that, oh, maybe demand's going to break here in NVIDIA. Oh, maybe the customers aren't going to be ordering as much, right? And next thing you know, stock goes down a bit. Wall Street buys it right up. Next earnings come, flies again. So it's going to remain that way until, until the growth story breaks in that one, the margin story. Fubo, next up here. This is a stock that has treated me very badly, very badly, right? Down 18K on this stock. It has treated me horrible. So Fubo has a huge situation going on right now, right? They have a lawsuit, a massive lawsuit against Disney, Fox, and Warner Brothers right now going on at the big court in New York City. And No one can talk about it. No one can talk about it. It is the most hush-hush major lawsuit situation I've probably ever seen in my life. So why is everybody being so hush? Why is CNN not covering this? Why is Fox News not covering this? Why is MSNBC not covering this, right? Where are all these big major publications to cover one of the biggest lawsuits in regards to the, the TV streaming era we've ever seen? Well, think about it for a moment. Who's, who's Fubo going after? They're going after Disney, which owns ESPN, right? And a bunch of other networks. They're going after Warner Brothers, right? And we know who they own. They're going after Fox. We know who they own. So if you're wondering why everybody's shh, so hush-hush about this, because no one wants anybody to know about this. No one wants anybody to know about this because it messes with their money, all the mainstream media's money, right? So that's why if you type in Fubo TV and you look news, it's like where, where's, where's the, uh, where's the talk here about this massive lawsuit going on in New York City right now, right? So you know where I have to go to find news about it? I have to go to some weird, obscure websites like Front Office Sports. That's who I have to go to for this major lawsuit. It's incredible. I mean, what a cover-up story this is. So Venue, that's the potential streaming new partnership these companies are having, which is, you know, a lot of people are considering some more monopoly-type practice here. Venue, Fubo TV, both say judge has power to kill their business. A judge declined to decide, this was yesterday, this came out, a judge declined to decide yet on an injunction to stop Venue from launching. Fubo TV's counsel told the judge that the company will run out of money by early 2025 if Venue is allowed to launch. By the way, I'm not so convinced of that, but anyways. At the close of a four and a half day hearing Monday, a federal judge declined. A federal judge, right? This isn't some small stuff going on here. This is huge. A federal judge declined to announce her decision on whether to grant an injunction. Fubo TV seeks to stop Venue Sports from launching. Venue, the much-anticipated live sports TV offering that will 
uh, boast 14 channels from Disney, Fox, Warner Brothers, all the ones that are trying to keep this situation hush-hush, aims to launch August 23rd, according to a claim made by the, the courtroom, Tom Schultz, a lawyer for Fubo. Venue declined to comment on a specific date. The judge said she would be mindful of the calendar. I am very mindful of the parties need certainty. While Garrett is not obligated to rule on anyone's timeline, that comment sounds more like we'll know within 10 days if Venue will be permitted to launch or blocked by Fubo. Fubo, arguing that Venue would violate antitrust law, sued the three media giants weeks after their February 6 announcement unveiling plans for the app. Fubo's core gripe is the three media companies refuse to license out their sports channels to distributors like Fubo, but will do so for Venue. That dynamic will spark a wave of cord cutting at pay TV distributors, Fubo argues, by sports fans in favor of a lower priced venue. What happens next? On Monday night, the sides were scheduled to file a 10-page post-trial brief summarizing their positions. When Judge Garrett eventually rules, each side will have the right to appeal her decision to the Second Circuit. If she grants injunction, Disney, Fubo, and Warner Brothers Discovery would possibly seek emergency relief in the higher court. Quote, a preliminary injunction would terminate the joint venture, Warner Brothers Discovery Council warned the judge. By contrast, Schultz, the judge, if Fubo does get the injunction, it will run out of cash by the first quarter of next year. That would mean insolvency, he says, right? Which, once again, I'm not convinced of that, but that's the argument Fubo is making there. In an effort to prove the injunction is in the public interest, one of the prongs required to get an injunction. Now, Schultz also cited a letter by Senator Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, and these different folks, right, to the Justice Department seeking an investigation into venue for possibly violating antitrust and communication laws. And, and here's the deal, okay? These, these guys have the big sports rights, right? Uh, Fox, ESPN, which is owned by Disney, obviously, right? Warner Brothers Discovery, they have the major sports rights. And so basically, they want to create this in-between service, right, where they're all going to benefit from this. And maybe they charge a cheaper price at first and they really go up a bunch on that price as time ticks on, right? Which is kind of an ugly situation because if you eliminate basically all competition, then you can just go up on price and up on price because you kind of have a monopoly on the sports rights. So then if you want to watch, I don't know, your some big football game or basketball game or baseball game or whatever, right, you have to go through their service, which is then kind of like a monopoly type practice because then no one else has the uh, access to that, right? Now, this leads us to YouTube TV because YouTube TV, where are they at in the regards to this situation? They don't mind it. They, they're, they're almost more on the Warner Brother, Fox, and ESPN side, in my personal opinion. The reason being is YouTube TV, I think they would love to eliminate Fubo. I think they look at somebody like Fubo TV as in the way. Like, I would think they would love if Fubo could get eliminated, right? Because we know YouTube TV, they don't need to make a profit short term. They're just about like, you know, they have so much money at Google that they could lose money on this for years to go in the future. They would rather just be the big dog streaming service, right? And keep in mind, they're, they're in with those guys. They're in with Disney. Like, who do you think's advertising all over YouTube and Google all the time, right? Disney, Fox, Warner Brothers. So the, those, those guys are all... They're all one, man. YouTube and those guys, they're all friends. Fubo's not really a friend. They're also not really a foe, but they could be seen as somebody in the way, right? And so I think it's in all these parties' best interest to eliminate Fubo, but we'll see if it happens. And my, my thought is if the judge is really fair, they will block this venue because it is not in the best interest of consumers for the long term at all. But I don't know what goes on behind closed doors. I don't know... You know, how they would view this. I don't know who pockets could get lined or not lined in the situation. There's a lot you got to factor in. So we'll, we'll see where it all shakes out. But that's kind of the update on Fubo in regards to that, right? Shopify. So a few months ago, I came out with a video, buy Shopify and don't stop, right? This is just a stock I view as a great buying opportunity. You know, every dip you get this year for Shopify, I think it's a phenomenal buying opportunity. This is a stock that's been anywhere it's between 40 something dollars this year and like, I don't know, $70 roughly, right? Check this out. This is just in the past eight trading days. Shopify has gone up 41% in eight trading days, right? And I mean, imagine this is why, this is a even bigger point than Shopify. This is why you take an advantage of 
massive crashes in the market, drama in the market is such an advantage. Like people fear drama in the market. They fear big drops in the market. Never fear it. Welcome it. Because let's say you were buying Shopify Monday morning, like I was, right? Guess what? You're already up 40% plus in that position. And guess what? That's in eight days. People hope to make 41% over several years, years. And you made 40 plus percent in eight trading days? In holding a great stock, it's not like Shopify is some you know, speculative, like, oh boy, Shopify, oh, that's a very speculative stock. Like, it's not a Fubo, okay? It's not like, like there's a lawsuit that might make or break that company. Like Shopify, you feel very confident buying that. And you're already up 40, 40 plus percent in eight days? Don't fear market drama. Appreciate it. Take advantage of those deals. It very rarely happens. But when you get that opportunity, you could make, you could make literally the amount of gains in days that people hope to make over years of being in, let's say, an S&P 500 index fund or something like that. It's unbelievable. Now, in regards to Shopify's latest earnings, I posted, so I break down a ton of income statements in the private group all the time, right? Inside the Discord chat under this tab called income statements. And I'm always grading these and teaching people how to read income statements, those sorts of things. In, in regards to Shopify, that was an A- minus income statement. Very good numbers. Uh, actually, borderline great numbers for Shopify overall. I was very, very happy, thrilled with that. And that stock will go back to all-time highs. All-time highs for Shopify is 150 plus. It will go back there over the next few years, and then it's going a lot higher. Shopify is one of those companies I look at, and when I think about companies that are, you know, $100 billion mark caps or less, and I think, like, have the opportunity over the next decade to be a tr the next trillion-dollar company, right, the trillion-dollar boys club, Shopify is one of those companies I think has the potential to get there eventually, right? Maybe Palantir has the potential to get there someday, right? But those are sorts of companies I usually kind of think about is like, who are those companies that are underdogs right now? Or like big, but they're under 100 billion, but they're coming. And like, you could see like how the growth profiles can get those companies there over the next 10, 15 years. I think Shopify has got a decent probability of getting there. Uh, we'll see where it all shakes out, right? The planet. You want to talk about a crazy five-day chart? Look at the planet. The stock's up 72%. I mean, my gosh. You know, this could be a very fun next one to two years in regards to the planet. And could we 10x from here, go back to that $7 range that the stock used to be many years ago? It's honestly a potential. And the reason it's a potential is planet's back to growth now. The margins are starting to head back up in the right direction. The profitability of the company should start heading in the right direction a massive way in the back half of this year and then going into next year. And so, and don't be surprised if planet all of a sudden gets profitable next year. And that's regardless of what happens in the economy. The Vegas location is starting to boom, and they've got more attractions coming to the Vegas location, so that location should boom even bigger and bigger and bigger. So we got Vegas running, right? The Orange County store is getting in a healthier stance, although that's been a kind of a big bit disappointment for the company. It's getting in a better place, right? And I think they're going to continue to figure out hacks on how to get that business even stronger and stronger. They got their wholesale business, which seems to be getting stronger and stronger. And they were talking on the recent conference call about building that out in Orange County as well. The Illinois opportunity looks pretty attractive. And the Florida opportunity is insane. They got, I think they were talking about six more stores open in there, which will bring their count to, I think, 30 plus stores here very soon in Florida. You're going to see their revenue explode to the upside over this next, I would call it, one to two years. Like, explode to the upside. And so the planet, I mean, it's the first time I've been excited about the planet in a long time, man. And uh, we got a lot to go off of here. And so just wait. Wait to see the revenue growth numbers that start hitting next quarter and the quarter after. They're going to shock people. And then when we start talking about those margins getting in a much healthier place in 2025, right, they're already going to start to improve. They're already starting to improve, right? But it's going to improve a lot more next year, in my opinion. And then when we talk about this company flips back to profitability, pew, 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 pew. next thing you know, you'll be seven plus again really soon. So very happy with the progress in Bob and Larry. I got to give those, those two CEOs or co-CEOs of the company. I got to give them a lot, a lot of credit because this company has been through some dark days, man. I still remember before Rona, right? Before Rona, this was a company that had one superstore and that was it. They had their Vegas superstore and that was it. And then the worldwide economy shuts down, Right. Whoa, how shocking was that? And when Vegas shuts down and you have one superstore, you're basically destined for bankruptcy. Well, the company pivoted. 
They started doing delivery to the local market. And that got them through that situation, right? Then the store opened again and Vegas started to slowly come back and the numbers got better and better and better. Then they built their Orange County store, right? Since then, they've made some acquisitions. And then, obviously, last two years happened, which was devastating. Inflation hit the consumer hard. The whole space got destroyed. Margins got destroyed for companies like the planet, right? I mean, incredible. And they've made it through to the other side. And now, things are starting to head back in the right direction. Margins, revenue, everything, right? And so... They've been through some dark days. They've been through some very dark days. And I think the light is starting to come down. I don't want to say I think. I know the light is starting to come out. Based upon those latest numbers and the latest conference call, I know the light's starting to come out. And um, it's going to be sunny, sunny, bright skies for a while here for the planet. So I'm thrilled about that because, yeah, it's been kind of a sad story for a bit. And uh, it's getting back to a, a good place again. All right, guys, appreciate you joining me. As always, if you're looking to apply, join a private stock group, private wealth group. That will be the pinned comment down there. You can apply to join us in there. Also get access to 1000 xstockscom Much love and have a great day.